introduce to you today Matthew Brogdon, um, who is he holds a position of lecturer in political science at Baylor University. He's near completion of his doctoral dissertation there, um, and his uh, dissertation examines the development of Article 3 of the Constitution, which is, of course, on the judiciary. His interests include constitutional development, American political thought, constitutional law, and religion and politics. He also directs the Moot Court program at Baylor. And I think that uh, today is an especially appropriate day for us to consider the theme of Professor Brogdon's address. Some of you might know, today is September 17th. Constitution. It's Constitution Day. Yes, this is the date on which the final draft of the uh, Constitution that was proposed at the uh, Constitutional Convention of 1787, that that was adopted. Uh, now, I might wish to claim that uh, I planned it, or that Matt and I planned it that way, um, <coughs> but in fact, it's a matter of chance, or maybe we could say, those of us who even secretly read Tolkien, um, as Gandalf would say, so chance it would seem, okay, but maybe there's something more uh, going on here, something that might be referred to as providence. Uh, with that in mind, it might be appropriate to consider the words of our first president, George Washington, who in 1778, while leading the army in the Revolutionary War, wrote these words to express his amazement at the relative success and endurance of the American cause against the British. The hand of providence has been so conspicuous in all this that we must be worse than an infidel that lacks faith and more wicked that has not gratitude enough to acknowledge his obligations. But it will be time enough for me to turn preacher when my present appointment ceases. And therefore, I shall add no more on the doctrine of providence. So on this uh, Constitution Day, I introduce to you uh, Professor Matthew Brockton, who's going to give his presentation, An Originalist Defense of Judicial Power. <coughs> uh, thank you for the warm welcome. Uh, I'm happy to be here at TLU. Uh, I'm accustomed to giving lectures to audience, which are uh, frankly under coercion. <laughs> <coughs> Normally mine, uh, I usually exercise a potentially despotic jurisdiction over my audience. So having one that's here voluntarily is really a nice treat. Um, I assume none of you will have your laptops out on Facebook, or, you know, texting on your iPhone. That'll be a nice change. <laughs> I've entitled the talk An Originalist Defense of Judicial Power, and this is intentionally provocative. Um, one expects to hear of an originalist critique of judicial power, maybe even a more neutral originalist view of judicial power. But hearing of an originalist defense of judicial power is a little off-putting. It's like hearing of an anarchical defense of government or uh, you know, a populist defense of aristocracy and elitism. Um, but part of what I'm here today is to demonstrate that those analogies are misguided. That uh, the connection between the animating spirit of the Constitution, given it by its framers in 1787, and the way that the institutions under it function now, especially the judiciary, is not so disparate as it might at first seem. Um, the framers were told, time and again, might have envisioned judicial review. They certainly understood the need for an independent judiciary, one insulated from popular control, because obviously, if you're accused of a crime, I don't know about you, but I would much rather have my case tried by the federal judiciary than by a congressional committee. Just ask any Major League Baseball player. Um, but we're told that, that they saw the need for this independence, perhaps even for something like judicial review. But certainly, the extensive institution that we find today embodied in the third branch of government, with all of its interventions into the administrations of the law, with all of its interventions into our daily lives, must certainly be outside of the expectations of those who frame the document. I'd like to challenge that notion the major functions of the federal judiciary, uh, which I'll outline in just a bit, 
I think we're embedded in the genetic code of the Constitution. Now I use this genetic code metaphor. Um, I've actually borrowed it from uh, a presidency scholar named Jeff Tullis, uh, who's at the University of Texas. I use the term genetic code uh, as a form of originalism because I want to set it in distinction from those we're accustomed to think of. When we think about originalism, that is an appeal to the original meaning of the Constitution, we hear it spoken of in several senses. You hear the original intention by which we look at particular framers, we try to determine who saw farthest and best the way the institution ought to operate and then construe the institution in that way. It's what we might call original intention. We've also got what's called the original understanding school. It's not really what individual framers thought. What's more important, what did the people who ratified the Constitution, those in the state ratifying conventions and those who elected delegates to the state ratifying conventions, understand those words to mean in 1787 or 88, depending on which state ratified it. And that's a certain kind of project. But what I'm doing, what I suggest is an originalist approach to judicial power, and I would say to the other institutional features of the Constitution, whether it's federalism or separation of powers or the appropriate functions of the executive or the administrative state, wherever we might look when we find institutional functions in the federal government, I would suggest the way we ought to look at them is in terms of rationale we ought to assume that the Constitution has an internal coherence, that it's a coherent frame of government, a system of government, almost like an organism with a genetic code. And it's quite plausible that those who create the genetic code for that organism might not foresee the manner in which it might develop. It doesn't mean that those developments are necessarily contradictory with the instrument itself, it may develop in ways that its framers didn't foresee. It may even develop in ways that its framers would abhor at times. Um, on the other hand, we often have no way of answering that question. How would James Madison look at the FTC? <laughs> I don't know. I'm not sure. But I think one way that we can examine political institutions, we can examine the functions of the judiciary to determine whether the way it functions and the roles it performs are consistent with our constitutional order, because that is an important question. I'm, I'm not aware of anyone or many people from whatever side of the aisle who seriously suggests that we should simply go about politics in whatever way we please. Everyone takes seriously the idea that there is an authoritative meaning in the Constitution. Our politics have to be conducted in a way that's consistent with it. Our laws have to be passed in a way that is consistent with the legislative process outlined in the Constitution. Our elections have to be conducted in ways that are constitutionally legitimate. Um, there's some sense in which the preservation of those institutional forms is all tied up with our liberty. Um, <clears throat> So whenever I look at something like the genetic code, I'd like to suggest what I'm not doing. I'm not picking out some particular framer or set of framers of the Constitution and suggesting that what they thought the institution would do is what we should take as our authority for its conduct. On the other hand, I'm not dispensing with what they thought either. They did, in fact, frame it. And their motives, their rationale, the reasoning behind the institution they created may be a helpful guide to finding out what are the features, the fundamental animating principles behind these institutions. But it may be the case that no one framer captures the institution fully. Uh, this is why, for instance, my research largely focuses on the Constitutional Convention. Not so that I can preach to you about, well, this is what James Madison thought should happen in the federal government. But because in that context we see the institutions, the language of the Constitution, the institutions they form, evolving in the midst of a deliberative debate. And from that debate emerge certain purposes and animating principles, a coherence. Most of the most important framers came to the convention with certain prejudices about what they thought a good government was. I'm not aware of any single framer of any importance who did not change their mind 
about what a good federal government would look like. Madison changed his mind radically about some features of the government and what, what we needed to form an adequate federal government. Gouverneur Morris, Alexander Hamilton, Rufus King, some of these names you know, some you don't. They're all key figures in framing the Constitution you and I live under. Um, let me suggest that the functions purported to be divergences from the constitutional order can be placed under three general heads. And these are the functions I'm going to examine and that I'm going to suggest the document itself, the Constitution, given some honest analysis of its animating principles and its purposes, actually legitimate. <clears throat> the three are this. One is preserving constitutional limits on both the states and the federal government. This is the most familiar role that the courts play, and it's one we harp on an awful lot. Uh, this is where we get the debates over what is free speech and what is comprehended under it, and what constitutes a search and seizure. Does that extend beyond persons, houses, papers, and effects? Right? Secondly, and perhaps one that gets a lot less attention, is the fact that the federal judiciary is expected to administer the law and to play a central role in the administration of the law. Now, I'll explain what I mean by that in a bit, but basically boils down to the fact that effective enforcement of federal laws requires a judiciary that's coextensive with the legislative and executive powers. The third is resolving disputes over the extent of federal power. This comes down to policing the federal system. How extensive are the powers of the states, which is largely answered by the answer to the question, how extensive is the federal government's power? However extensive it is, it's supreme. So to extend federal power is to have a recession of state power, necessarily. Federal laws made in pursuance of the Constitution are the supreme law of the land. Anything in the Constitution or laws of any state to the contrary notwithstanding. Okay, let's, uh, let's look at these one at a time. Um, there's a document, do you happen to have those? Um, there's a document that uh, Professor Walsh will pass around to you. It's simply got some constitutional provisions on it and a few provisions that were debated in the Constitutional Convention. I pass these out just to make sure that we don't lose track. Uh, when I go to spouting off quotes from constitutional language like the vesting clauses, it can get a little hard to follow. <clears throat> so I've said that the framers of the Constitution expected the judiciary to give effect to constitutional limits. I think the first place to look for this is in the text of the Constitution. If you look on the, the first side, it has Article 1, Article, Article 3, Article 6, it has some excerpts from the Constitution. If you look at the, uh, the Article 6 provision all the way at the bottom of the page, this Constitution, the laws made in pursuance thereof, and all treaties made or which shall be made under the authority of the United States, should be the supreme law of the land. The judges in every state should be bound thereby. Anything in the Constitution or laws of any state to the contrary notwithstanding. In short, the Constitution, any law made pursuant to the Constitution, and any treaty made under federal authority take precedence over state constitutions and laws. State judges are given, in fact, are, are given the responsibility, the duty, to strike down any of these provisions that violate federal law, federal constitution, or federal treaties. In the course of doing so, inevitably, they have to decide which federal laws are made in pursuance of the Constitution and other such things. Um, now, if you look at the text of Article 3 and actually look at Section 2, so the judicial power, and I might add parenthetically, of the United States shall extend to all cases in law and equity arising under this Constitution, the laws of the United States and treaties made or which shall be made under their authority. 